Welcome back to the motherfucking podcast, y'all. Hi. <laughs> I'm Lacey. I'm Stephanie. And this is Oh, Here, Here we, we go. go. Today, we are bringing on Muzzy Bear, a.k.a. Zan. A.k.a. <laughs> we're so excited about this. Yeah. So what's interesting, uh, we would we always want to incorporate having artists on the podcast, Um Stephanie's a local here in Denver, and there's a ton of, like, I don't know if I'm a local if I just moved you're, here. You're some. Right? I don't know. You're, you, you would be considered, like, a local hire. Come on now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, but you have, um, you just made a lot of friends here, especially, like, in the artist space, the music industry. Um, <laughs> and so we just always want to have creatives on here, and... Muzzy was actually like on our, you know, our radar and we were on the phone one day and we're like, oh, yes, we need to reach out to Muzzy to have him on the podcast next month. And we like wake up to a group Instagram message from Muzzy being like, hi, ladies. And we were like, what the fuck? What are the chances? The fastest manifesting I've ever done. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So it was it was really nice to kind of see that come to fruition and you know, meet him. And it, this was such a good conversation because first of all, he's really easy to talk to, but you know, I, I just made a friend and you know, one minute, you know, as yeah. soon as he sat down, I was like, Oh, you're my friend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's, well, Lacey and I have said this over and over again, but, um, the music space here that really he's in and, you know, the, I don't, the, the electronic scene here, <laughs> I guess. I don't really know what to call What's it What's the umbrella? Whatever umbrella it is, is like our favorite, like funk and yeah. mixing that with like EDM and it's just always been our favorite. So he comes from that space and to have someone like him on and to talk about not only music and like where it started for him and NFTs, but also like ADHD and mental health and mm-hmm. being queer in the music industry and what all that means and has done and all all the things. So it was like, it's, it's always good to, we always appreciate bringing musicians on that, you know, you have this one thing to talk about, but there's more than that, you know? Yeah, there's so much more to you than what people know you as yeah there's the background there's what you've been through and everything like that so we really enjoyed this one you guys yeah (laughs) yeah baddie for this one yeah (laughs) (laughs) but um but yeah without further ado i think we're just gonna hop right into it yeah let's get it all right Mm -hmm. bye And now for a quick commercial break. Yeah. <laughs> Introducing our sponsor, Jimbo and Jules. You already know the deal. We are <laughs> all about some full spectrum CBD, <laughs> organic, ethically sourced products. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you that are avid listeners, you may recognize this company from us bringing on Jimbo to talk about CBD and how he cured his um, Lyme disease with bee venom therapy and after that, we just kind of got hooked on his products. We got to try a few things, and we love it. And so and now be, we're here. Yeah, <laughs> now to be able to partner with them on this level is just incredible. Yeah, and we feel really fortunate. Yeah, we love this stuff. We got lavender lip balm, which we use every single day. Yeah, we do. Um, Sleep Deep. The hemp, or I guess the hemp oil or CBD oil, I ran out of mine. But I was using that every morning, every night, uh, just for inflammation. Also, there is a relief salve. If you're watching um, our YouTube right now, you can see me holding it up. But I know when I'm stressed, my shoulders get extremely tight. Like when I, I don't know what it is. Like it's not how I'm standing or anything. My shoulders are like, it hurts. Yeah. And I love this shit for that. Like it's good. The topical working, stuff like works fast, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So I personally like this one too. I really like the sleep deep. Um, I'm someone that on high intensity days or stressful days when we have a lot going on and kind of falling asleep is a little bit harder for me. Um, but I like, I love this stuff. And I know that recently they just did a, I think they did a, what do you call it? Research using like 50 study. Yeah. Study with like 50 people and they saw a 90, over 95% of people saw sleep improvement in just 14 days. 
And I'm like, I totally relate to that because that has this stuff is great. Um, so if you're somebody that kind of struggles in that area a little bit and you want a more holistic approach, this is for you. And a gift from us to you is a good old 20%. Oh. Yeah, so do, oh, here we go, 20, whenever you're checking out. And um, you're welcome, and you can just thank us in the band. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> let's hop back into the episode. <laughs> Hi guys! <laughs> Hi, <laughs> y'all. Today we have on somebody we've always wanted on. <laughs> How did we introduce you? Just Muzzy Bear, Dan, Real name. Hawaii Dan, <laughs> Hawaii Dan. I, I'm not Hawaii Dan, but it's, it's an inside joke. You guys, you that's good. for us. Insider. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Muzzy. Well, yeah. How 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 do you? Dan want to? is good. Muzz, Muzzy, Muzzy okay. Bear. Okay. We'll kind of throw in a little mix every just, now just, and then. You know, spice it up yeah. <laughs> you call, me, call me what you like I don't, your yeah, exactly. <laughs> tell us about yourself tell uh, you? yeah what's up why are you here today okay. i know you hate this well i was <laughs> <laughs> i am a entrepreneur finance bro and oh. a little bit of this little bit of that i you know i've really day trade in oil futures stop <laughs> uh, hedge funds yeah that's me yeah. <laughs> stonks <laughs> uh yeah i'm dan uh i perform and make music under the name muzzy bear I do disco house music. Mm. I do photography, graphic oh. design. I do recently analog video, trippy, glitchy art stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. which we've talked yes, about. Yes, I was showing her that. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to like. That you did you know, part great. Just you know then. how many characters they let you have in a Twitter bio and trying <laughs> to fit all that in. I'm like, I do, e I do everything. <laughs> I'm so complex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm one of those people that hyperfixates for six months and then moves on to the next thing. That's oh, me. Oh, so do you have you ADHD? Know? Oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Big bad. Yeah. yeah. Big, big, big bad. Big bad. <laughs> Wait, so disco house music. I yeah. love that shit. What, don't, what, is, what does that sound like? Is it right bringing now? in like like disco music from the 60s and 70s and throwing in house? Or how, what's your method of it? So I think the, 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 the whole thing for me is that I realized like, all of that stuff was the stuff that was playing in clubs. So if we were going out to clubs now, it would be disco music. Mm. Just, you know, that was the same culture. And a lot of that stuff is four on the floor. It's just they didn't have drum machines quite yet. Oh. You know? So really for me, it's combining all the musical aspects of funky, groovy disco stuff from the 70s and 80s and then mixing in kind of that new flavor that mm -hmm. came around in the early 2000s with like Daft Punk and Ed oh. Banger Records and mm -hmm. all that stuff. And okay. I mean, I grew up in Detroit, and next weekend is the Gearly Movement Electronic Music Festival, which is like all house and tech now. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. And I think, yeah, for a long time I was going to that, and I was like, house music is only good at movement festival. This is the only <laughs> time I like house music. And yeah. then I realized, like, after years of denying myself that joy, I was like, all right, I'm a, I'm just trying making this stuff, see all how right. it feels. Oh, okay. And now it's it's all I've ever wanted. Yeah, just going house music, baby. Wait, wow. so okay, so you started off. When did you start? I guess being interested in music like that, creating wise. Mm. Well, I mean, like I took piano lessons when I was a kid. Cute. Like me and my dad, he like dra like he's a musician, like hobbyist guy, and him and all his siblings took up like we're in marching band and I did all this stuff. So naturally, when I was a kid, he's like, we're doing piano lessons. And then I did band in school and all that stuff. So music was always kind of it for me. Okay. Okay. Life. I think when high school rolled around, I was like, yeah, I'm the music guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm that one. I'm, I'm the guy with the guitar at the campfire playing Wonderwall. That's oh, <laughs> wow. It was like that. That's me. <laughs> okay. I was that guy. <laughs> Wait, so, but as far as electronic music yeah, goes. producing. Yeah. What, when did that hit? That was right at the end of high school, like graduate high school, going into college. Mm. Because I was very, like, electronic music, whatever, booms and claps and tss, tss, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Because up until that point, it was, like, my only experience with dance music was at bar mitzvahs when they were playing, like, party rock anthem. <laughs> and I was like, what is this? <laughs> my year, in my days, they played Yeah by Lil John and Eastside <laughs> Boys and Usher. And, they, you know, like, that was, that was my era. But then yeah. I was like, these young kids are listening to all this boots and cats music. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> and like the only thing I really liked was like instrumental hip hop beats mm. like okay. Jay Dilla or 
I like Flying Lotus at that point, but I didn't realize any of that was any kind of electronic music or made on drum machines or anything. So it wasn't until I really like met Grizz, started hanging out with him that he showed me a lot of the music that I realized now wow. is like big influence. Like right. I remember I was like, hey, I'm going to my first music festival this summer after uh, freshman year of college. I was like, who's good on this lineup? Who should I mm. check out? I'm going for the jam bands. Like who, any of these names good? He was like, oh, yeah. Big Gigantic's really good. Mm. Skrillex is really good. Wow. He's like, bass neck, redacted, never mind. Right. We'll edit that out. We'll edit that yeah. out. It's like, check those guys out. And I was like, yeah, cool. All right. And I just remember going through the lineup and being, that was like mm-hmm. the first year electronic music was really getting onto the festival scene. Right. And like wow. Got to see a lot of artists that to this day are like some of my biggest influences. Mm. So like, I'd say... Freshman year of college, like 2010, 2011 was really like. That was like the prime time spot like for it. Yeah. Well, I guess people like Big Gigantic and all that, they're not considered house, right? No. Okay. Because no. I think I've discovered, I used to say, I'm like, I don't know. I don't like house or whatever. I used to say that. But then now getting to the space here, I'm like, oh, wait, I don't, I'm not a big techno like mm. oomsk, oomsk person, but I do like house because mm. this is like a huge umbrella. But I've learned that EDM is a huge umbrella. Like, would house and techno be under EDM, or would EDM be under that? You know. <laughs> Help. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Back in the day, Pitching. when when all these things were happening, hello. <laughs> we have a dog here. <laughs> Back in the day, um, I used to say, like, yeah, EDM is the umbrella. But now, as it's all grown, we realize that EDM is more of a genre of its Mm. own thing. Like, that's where you have, like, Zed and Avicii and, like, that kind of Martin Garrix, like, big Mm -hmm. big stages with big anthems. Like, that's what I would call EDM now. And it's all under just the electronic music umbrella. Okay. Okay. But back in the day, it was a lot easier to just say, yeah, it's EDM. Right. It's so new. And it's this new. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> it's this newfangled thing. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I, I think now, you know. Did you like the heavier music whenever you first listened to it? Like, when you went to that festival and he told you, like, these are the people to go see, like, what do you think? It's, okay, I loved it. There were a couple artists that, you know, nowadays maybe uh, have turned into, like, the purveyors of this massive, like, bass music right. thing. It was always, I mean, like, my entire exposure to electronic music came through Grizz okay. and Grant. Like, mm. so his music was the first electronic music to really click for me. Wow. So then all of his influences became things that I really liked. So Pretty Lights and that yeah. whole camp and, like, Aphex Twin and Square Pusher and really, like, out there stuff. Um, but then, you know, I remember driving around. I had my Summer Camp Music Festival 2011 Aww iPod playlist with yeah. like Skrillex and who else was on that? Boombox, Big Gigantic. Like I was, I was a big like uh, borrowing music from the internet guy. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so I was like all about. My I'm sorry, by the way, if he's he's like just a noble no, steed. Listen, this is listen. I this is therapy right now. <laughs> yeah, I. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm all with it. Well, this I'm is the first it. time he, we've done four interviews, and this is the first time he's done what he's doing right now, so he must really like you. Hey. So, dog I'm, guy. A, I'm a floofy spirit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Aw. Hey. Um, but yeah, I remember driving around and like having that playlist on all the time, so when I got there, I was like so stoked to see Skrillex, and he played it. 3 p.m. in the afternoon on the smallest stage ever. (laughs) And then he won five Grammys that year. So, like, that was where we were at back then. Okay. Like, the heaviest, like, back in the days, like, Excision was smaller than Skrillex was. Mm. So it was not even a thing. So I guess that came along, like, a couple years later, the really heavy, aggressive dubstep now that is totally... Some people's flavors, but not mine. Uh-huh. You know, I was also the same kid that, like, when the, when I was going through my emo phase, I was like, the singer has to be singing, you know? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah. Ha- you, like <laughs> I like the screamo stuff, but not too much of it, yeah, you know? Right. I think everything in doses. This is insane. He's being so cute with you right now. I'm like, <laughs> should I take a photo? Get in. Like, oh, my gosh. Pito, you're being so cute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> Um, we loved summer camp. Yeah, yeah, we just went for the first time in August, and it was amazing. It was one yeah. of my favorite festivals. Yeah. Did it rain? 
No, no, it didn't. It was wow. in August, so it was like super dry. But okay. it was, yeah, that's what I've heard from everybody that it always rains. Um, it always rains. But you have a heavier song with Grizz, right? Like so a remix. Yeah, we have. I mean, we have some songs. I mean, I was playing guitar and he- like making music with him for ten years, and I think through that time and like watching his growth and seeing where he was going with things. I was happy to be a part of it. Right. Mm-hmm. But now in the past few years, especially like over the pandemic where there was no touring of any kind and I was just like left with my own devices, mm. I was like, oh, you know what? This groovier, housier stuff feels more me. Okay. You know, it's more musical. I get to play my instruments when I'm in the studio and, you know, not to take away anything from any kind of music. I think to be a good musician, you have to be able to grab and resonate with one piece of all kinds of music. But for me, it's like, I can't, like my brain doesn't work with like making bass patches. Right. Like wubs for eight hours. (laughs) And being like that one. (laughs) (laughs) That one right there. That's going to get the people going. You know, like I respect it too much. I'm not that focused. Like I can't. I'm yeah. like, let me get this keyboard sound and then play the keyboard part and move on to the I next thing. I love that. You I know, love like that there's more like yeah. of that intricacy involved and everything. Um, I guess during the, when was the last time you've played live? Mm. So I've been getting back out there. It's getting out there, y'all. I'm back. <laughs> I'm back. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, shows are back, but I have been kind of like trying to figure out for me, I'm in this tra- like transformative stage where before the pandemic, I was full-time playing with Grizz all the time and doing my own thing on the side. And now it's all me. Yeah, wow. You know? And it's turns out less busy when you're not touring with someone that's really busy all the time. <laughs> so yeah. I've, I've been taking that time and like working on a bunch of new stuff and kind of like figuring out what the next six months looks like as far as finishing music and putting that out and then also touring around the shows. There's like all this planning and all of this Mm. promoting and all this stuff. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't have to do all so much of all of that before. (laughs) It just kind of went. It was more daunting. And yeah, I was just like, all right, here's the song three times a year. And now it's like, no, you need to put out a song every month. I'm like, oh, every month. Wow. Wow. I mean, I guess that, so with you having originally been touring so much with Grizz and being in under that umbrella and space, like was this decision to like break, to be like more on your own? Like was that, when was that? Or like what brought that? It was over the pandemic. I was just, you know, I think there have been times where, and I'm not, I'm not throwing, I'm not saying anything that people, I don't think, I think everyone kind of knows, but like when you're working with someone and you're also dating that person uh you know and you're also working for that person and all this stuff it kind of gets messy it becomes friction yeah there's friction there absolutely and but like for a long time I was very I was like it's cool I'm I'm down it's your ship you steer and like you let me know when you need me to help with the music side or you want me to just play the shows and all this stuff and then the pandemic hit all the shows were gone he was here I was there I was in my bedroom making beats on Twitch every day, and I was like, you know what? It's time. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm we had a discussion. This. Yeah, we had a discussion, and it was just like, hey, is it time? Yeah. And we were both like, it's time to spread your wings. It's time. <laughs> wow. It's time. Wow. So during the yeah. pandemic, you two were totally separated. He was here in Denver, and I was in Detroit. That's mm. cool. Like, so yeah. how, as far as like music making goes how hard was that for you? Mm. Like, where did you get the inspiration during a time like that? Or did it kind of come easier because you had more, more time? So I learned that a reason, a big reason why releasing music was hard for me for a number of years was because I was never home. Mm. Like we were touring at the peak of it. And the peak was like three years straight, like 2014 through 17, 18, maybe 16 and 19. I don't know. There was a point where it was like, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you fly on, leave on Thursday, come back on Monday. So you're only home on Tuesday and Wednesday, like full days. And for me, I'm how you say a cave dweller, you know, like I like to settle in Mm -hmm. and then emerge. Yeah. 
emerge from my cave after hibernation and then start making music or being creative. Like I need that reset. Mm -hmm. And for years there was no reset. Like Mm -hmm. I was just go, go, go. And to Grant's credit, he's really good at working in general, but like even on the road, like he would, we would be on the bus. He'd be making music on the bus. I'd be like, where, where are we today? We're in (laughs) Birmingham, Alabama. (laughs) Like where's breakfast? Birmingham. (laughs) Birmingham. What are we going to do with that music? One thing, I mean, you saying about him working so hard, um, I see his like Instagram stories and I even went to his Red Rock show um, last (sighs) summer and I brought Uh, my best friend Mm. it was his first time seeing Grizz live and he did like three sets and then played an after party and he was like this dude is an animal (laughs) he's an alien what the fuck how do you just play for like eight hours straight how do you have that much music and create all the time like he also like produces music Mm -hmm. and so he was just like who is this person that has to be like hard to keep up with it is. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, yes, it is. Yeah. So I've I think been trying. that's great that you, well, I think that's great you were able to keep up with it for so long, but I also think it's great that you were able to find this space where you're like, you know, I've done that and now I want to do it this way. And this and is what my works way. For you. And then with my own disco house yeah. vibes and everything. Yeah. I just, you know, I think that's exactly it. Like, we were. I, we were running full speed, and I felt like at certain times he was like, come on, we're going. Yeah. Like, he was holding my hand, and I was, like, holding on for dear life. <laughs> and I'm like, this is amazing. I love all of this. I love all of this. <laughs> Do I love paying rent and never being home? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow, yeah. Do I love not seeing my family for six months? Like, stuff like that started right. to creep up on me, and I'm like, is that why I'm not producing as much? Because mm. I need to be, like comfortable in my life so that I can balance that with being creative and like yeah I realized I'm much more of that person I'm like I need all of the other things I need a couple shows a month and then yeah. like en- enough to keep me my heart ho- whole and like playing music with people and like all that I need a little bit of that but I need a lot more creature comfort a lot more yeah. hang out at home a lot more be productive once I'm ready to be productive and not like I can't, like, force it. Right. I mean, you can't force creativity like that, you know? No. What you said about, I mean, uh, just being attracted to this groovier electronic music and, you know, you first really clicking when you heard Grizz's music. Yeah. When we first got into the electronic scene, we first found Big Gigantic, or you showed me Big Gigantic, and then it was Grizz. And that's what really spoke to me was this mm. like groovier electronic sound and still that's what feels like home I love like all this other shit like now but we all the time Stephanie and I are like thank god for this type of music yeah. like what would we do without it like, like it's like real instruments it speaks yeah. to us so much like we yeah. always listen to this shit and we're just like what the fuck I like yeah. we're so thankful we're for so it. thankful for it I think I discovered pretty lights first which mm-hmm. is also where I discovered LSD for the first time <laughs> so <laughs> yeah and, I think hand, <laughs> hand, 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 you know. and then it was big gigantic and I remember my first big gigantic show I was like are they gonna play that one song and like I didn't know anything <laughs> I knew that one song and it was the one with Grizz and mm. um yeah and it's just like developed over there but the both the whole funk and the whole soul and the real instruments in it is where, yeah, like I vibe the most. I guess I didn't really know that you focus more on guitar. Yeah, I mean. How long have you been playing that? Shit. <laughs> <laughs> shit. I'm going to. I was in diapers. Yeah, I'm going to be 30 this year. I just oh. doxed my age. So Wait, I, when's yeah. your birthday? September 30th. Mm. What is that? What sign is that? Is that Libra? Libra. Oh my god, I was just saying, me and my boyfriend were just saying last night, we're like, we don't know any Libras. <laughs> wow, am, baby. cute. So you like the balance. That I like makes the so balance. much sense. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm 30 now, and I started, like, I was like, yo, I'm going to play guitar. This is my thing. <laughs> when I was, like, 12. Oh, oh wow, okay. that's my instrument. Yeah, yeah, so, like, a long time. So you're, I'm assuming you're close with your mom, and... Are they supportive of the music? Have space? they always been? Ye- okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're we're opening cans of worms here. I <laughs> we <laughs> love doing that. Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I love that so much. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> wow. <laughs> so, like I said, my dad was my dad and mom were like very take piano lessons, play in the band at school, and do musical theater, and then. High school rolled around and I was like starting to try and play in some bands and stuff. And then it wasn't until I dropped out of college to pursue music and touring with Grant and all of this stuff. What become, you know, ha- pursuing what it became uh, that they were really supportive. And then once I was like, yo, I'm going to I remember telling them, I was like, I think I want to go to music school. Knowing in my head I was not going to school. I was not going to music school. I was going home. I was leaving one school to audition for music school but like I knew I wasn't good enough to get in and all this stuff but I went through the whole thing and they were like great you'll go to music school and you'll do music stuff and then I was like "Eh, or maybe I'll just do the DJ stuff (laughs) and I'll just produce beats and make beats and go on tour that they were like are you sure this is what you want to do are you certain do you really want to do the whole thing and like there were definitely times where it was friction again Mm -hmm. but you know, when things started to get busier and start to, you know, I was able to support myself through the touring and the music and the things and the being creative and all that stuff that I think they came around and now they're super supportive and they, you know. Right. I think at a certain point, parents just want to see their kids happy. Yeah, that's yeah. that's pretty much the same story I have. Like I went to, I was in college for three years and then when I got my loans back, I was like, wait, what? Um, mm. mm-hmm. you, I owe how much? And I was going to be a teacher and I was doing photography though. And I was like, mom dad like I'm already making more than what a teaching degree would ever give Mm -hmm. me so I think I'm good here Mm -hmm. and they were like so upset and they were like you have one more year like why would you and I was just like because that's one more year of like all these loans and but now that they've seen what it is they are so supportive and I think I think it's good for parents to be to check in and be like hey like are you sure maybe no don't ever stop the dream but I think there is that sense of like you need to prove to your parents like hey like No, trust me, like, I've got this, and I I completely understand, like, both, so that's cool that they now, yeah, because we've, we brought Borom on with Pretty Light, Uh, Mm. yeah, and he told us his parents have literally no idea what he he really does, so (laughs) they're just like, sure, okay, whatever, yeah, Yeah, so it's cool that your parents are, like, in it now. Yeah, (laughs) I remember them coming to their first show, and they were like, okay. (laughs) Oh, what, what, what show was that? It was... One of the so every year we were we're doing Grismas in Detroit and like I finally was like guys mm-hmm. it's here and they're like it's gonna, we're gonna have to drink coffee it's past our bedtime <laughs> cute and I was like drink then drink the coffee <laughs> double shot of espresso yeah, exactly <laughs> get this woman an IV stack <laughs> and they finally were like oh okay we get it like you wow. know they were always again like they're they always love supportive. It? Or is that type of music they're like, what the fuck is happening? Mm-hmm. They, hmm. mm-hmm. <laughs> I can't speak for their taste. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I know they enjoy it. I think it's part of the, you know, it's hard to deny like this crazy, awesome, euphoric experience yeah. for anyone. You know, mm-hmm. maybe it's not something they're going to buy a ticket to. You know, I've, right. I've, I've brought friends to shows that were like, I'm really glad I came. That was awesome. And they would have never. See like, ya. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it blows my mind because we are we will listen to that type yeah. of music and we're like, how would anybody not like this? We don't get it. We don't. And so it just, I mean, but it's a thing. But that's, and like, that's everyone with the things that they like. Right. Yeah. You know? yeah. How would anyone not love the things that I love the most in the world? And right. then you meet someone, you're like, I don't know. Fleet Foxes, kind of boring. You know, Aww, and you're like, you yeah. know, it's like, that, it's anything. Do you or, like Fleet Foxes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was a random, random call. <laughs> I, just, I just love them. Or yeah. I don't love them, but I like them. And so yeah. I just wasn't expecting you to mention them today. So. You know, here we are. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a wild card, baby. <laughs> you never know I'm going to pull out of my hat next. <laughs> well, I know that you're kind of, are you getting in the NFT space? Oh, God. <laughs> oh God. Is that maybe part of the... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your Instagram is muzzybear.eth, right? It is. All right. Well, it's just oh, muzzybear, but then the title is that. .eth. Okay. Look at you. Wow, Look I know. I'm really you. impressed with you. <laughs> that, yeah, that's impressive. Wow. Well, well tell us about that. Everyone. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll tag you. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so is that what's maybe getting into the NFT space another reason why you, was that another push to do your own thing or? So, yeah, I mean, totally. I think that was really like a reinforcing idea because 
you know, the thing is, is there are only so many people that are able to sustain themselves as artists. And especially having spent so much time around someone that's fortunate enough to be one of those people where, you know, Grant gets to make music all the time and he does make music all the time. And then he gets to go out th that weekend and play a show and he can say yes to the shows he wants to and no to the shows he doesn't. And then, you know, for other people like me, like with my solo stuff, it was always kind of like, a, I have to say yes to every show because I need the money and I love playing shows, but like, that's the only source of income is shows. Right. And I'm not making any streaming revenue. Like, I love when I get the little email like, oh, here's your SoundCloud payout. It's a dollar and 26 cents. <laughs> and I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what about Thanks. Spotify? It's like, I think the most I've ever cashed out from my Spotify was like 300 bucks. Wow. Does Apple pay more than Spotify? I mean, you know. By like we're, a we're half a penny? <laughs> maybe one grain of sand is now two grains of sand. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, okay. You know, it's not like the, it's not, it's not sustainable. Right. You know, I think that there are some people, again, it's like a similar situation. These like lo-fi beats to study to people are making a living off of cool mm. beats and streaming numbers and stuff like that. But I'm neither of those things. I'm not touring and getting paid the big bucks to play shows and I'm not getting millions and millions of streams on my music so for me and a lot of people like me that kind of like are full-time in their heart and soul artists and creative create creative <laughs> create art, art creative <laughs> they're artists full-time and creativity is their job that's what I was gonna say <laughs> um I think that something like nfts you can find an audience and if you're doing something that's unique and showing people that you are someone that they can grow with, like as a fan or as a mm. collector, there's a lot of options out there. You know, I saw this guy, his name is Javon. Uh, he's been an artist and a rapper, like a uh, illustrator, an animator and rapper. I've known about him for seven years, and now he launched this project called The Loser Club that's like one of the dopest, you know, one of these profile picture projects and like, absolutely crushed it mm. he's like i'm so stoked like i just got my mom taken care of and like my daughter's taken care of wow. and you know because he's a cool guy that made cool art that people resonated with now you know half of my twitter feed is people with his characters as their profile picture mm. and i get to hang out with those people in discord or on twitter and like they're all artists too so we're helping each other and like wow there's a few different ways you can go about it, but another, you know, Prob Cause, who works with Grant and is a good friend. Oh, his art is so cool. And he's, you know, had one of the best years of his life Whoa. because of NFTs. Like, yeah. you know, he's doing these things called Scullies, where every couple of months he drops a few, and or every month he drops a few, and, like, you know, he's able to do things that he wasn't able to do before financially and, like, take real risks because he has the independence to do so and wow so with you know. the nft space on your end come up um because i guess i know that there's like two different avenues or ones that are approaching and then there's like the illustration side and then there's like a releasing exclusive music side to it right which one would you be on uh -huh. oh okay so it's kind of up in the air okay yeah. well well we interviewed um like we interviewed Richard Hart, who does hex cryptocurrency, and yeah. he his take on NFTs were that he thinks that they're like pointless or like they're like beanie babies or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so, but I and I had always not knowing enough, felt confused about the NFT part. But when it came to the music part, I was like, I see, I see that. Like mm -hmm. I see this extreme value and like giving someone something that like why is I don't know why it's audibly more um worth i don't know mm. i don't know what it is but yeah so <laughs> i have an answer there was no question there but I have <laughs> oh, an answer. thank you because i would love an answer yeah, i got it i got an explanation so i agree i think that the way that nfts are existing now is very faddish you know when when i say nfts what's the first thing you think of the Bored Apes, right? Or Crypto oh. Punks or like something yeah. like something that. Something of yes. like MFers. That's the one right. I really wanted. Shouts out Sartoshi. Um, <laughs> yeah. But you know, something like that. Like yeah. one of these profile picture projects that is, you know, really just a screaming match of like, well, mine's cooler than yours because I got a sweatshirt. You yeah. Know? Right. Mine's cooler than yours because we have a cool website. And <laughs> yeah. mine's cooler than yours because I have a cool community of people that I get to hang out with. And like this very like tribalism and 
that's it's it gets weird and i've spent <laughs> a lot of time in this space and i've realized that like nobody knows anything and like this is all that's a lot of it's learned too yeah, yeah a lot of it's very bullshit like it's great but a lot of like there are so many people just kind of selling something that doesn't exist or have value they're like it's valuable because we made it and we're telling you it is right yeah. well value is whatever the it's all perceived. Yeah, yeah yeah but the thing is is like nfts are really a technology it's not a picture a so picture is not an nft and the nft is like ownership and using oh. the blockchain to like be like oh cool Lacey bought Muzzy Bear's album and you can see that because it's on the blockchain and it says this person transferred this to this person and they own it. And it just so happens that like this art thing, fad, whatever, is the, the I guess, the Trojan horse that's been like pushing towards people understanding horse. it more. Yeah. You know, like I think that it's going to it'll always be a thing, but it's not the thing forever. You know, that's a good way to put it. Wow. There's a world where, like, you own your social media profile picture. Like, yeah, you created yeah. it. It's a picture of you, but you own it. And, like, I don't know. Maybe it's not valuable, but, like, you you actually own it. It's not just, like, on an Instagram server somewhere. Yeah. yeah. You know? Wow. That's the idea of, like, owning the internet. Owning yeah. your presence on the internet. Owning websites. Like, actually owning them or owning a piece of art that's on a website and actually being the person that owns it. And, like... Mm -hmm digital museums and you know there's so many people that are some of the most amazingly talented artists but they don't paint on a canvas so they can't sell their art because mm. people are like well it's it's on the computer i can just download it and save it forever mm. you know but there's something to be said about them you know those people being able to legitimately sell digital art and someone seeing value in owning a piece by beeple or a piece by muzzy bear because it's cool and has music and video and it can go on a digital frame in their house. Right. Like, I see a future where that is real, but I do think this whole like collectible owning a picture of a character that mm -hmm. came in, into existence out of nowhere, like I think that is a fad for sure. Yeah, I love the way you just explained that. Right, uh, literally the first time I've been like, wow. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, do you think NFTs will always just be in the avenue of just art? Because like you said, it was a technology where you can see the transaction and you can see where you actually own something. Right. Like, will it be moved into, will companies start using it for goods and services? Yeah. I mean, so the the first thing that comes to my mind, and the, I think the thing that really clicked with me in the first place with all of NFTs is I'm a huge dork. Like, biggest nerd ever. I When I'm not doing art, I'm playing video games or, like, hanging out with my friends on the internet or whatever. And I'm that totally that sucker that, like, spent a couple hundred bucks on Fortnite skins. You know, <laughs> like, I'm that guy. Um, and, <laughs> like, yeah, hell yeah. I have the Are you skin. a Dungeons and Dragons guy? 100%. Because, uh, yeah, 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 I was I'm wondering. Huge dork. Everything. If you can be nerdy about it, I'm nerdy about it. Um, but, like, I don't actually own any of the skins for any of my video game characters. Right. I don't own them. Like, I can't sell them to you. I'd have to sell someone my whole account. And mm. then, like, that's always been a thing. But imagine a world where, like, you buy the skin that's available in 2022. And then when this game is still popular in 10 years and you can't buy that skin anymore because they just never put it out again or whatever. You have it. You can. You, I could sell it to and someone. It's like vintage. Exactly. Oh. Yeah, because, wow. of you know, there's right. like this sense of ownership now where it's like each thing is individual and like. That's cool. That's just for video games. There's a million different applications like outside of just art. That's you know? so cool. I didn't even think about it like that. Wow. Also, that like hit. some I, some people argue, well, like I can just screenshot it, which absolutely. Yep. Yes, you can. Like I was really wanting to get an MF -er, and mm -hmm. I screenshotted all the ones I wanted. I mm -hmm. really wanted one with a fucking cowboy hat. Um, Your time will come. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like, um, it's almost like, you know, of course, one, well, if you just screenshot it, you don't own it. Therefore, right. there's no monetary value for your little screenshot. Right. But two, it's almost like the having the morality for supporting the artist and being a part of something. And also, I've seen it just be another way of an investment. Like, yeah. you know, you can invest in crypto in the stock market, but you can also invest in this and have a, have a little pretty picture. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Totally, yeah. I mean, like, my, my initial investment in, like, 
I don't, I don't, I don't be having money like that. You know, like, <laughs> so, like I'm, I'm, I'm more about it for the tech and the art of it. Like I've, I've made a little bit of like come ups with the NFTs and like buying this and then selling it to get another one that I liked a little bit more. But ultimately mm-hmm. the thing for me was like, wait, so if I keep, buying and selling and trading and like coming up with a little bit more Ethereum, I can spend it on a piece of art from an artist that I want to support and just like have it. And I don't care if it's not worth anything to anyone else. I got to support this artist and now I own this piece of art and I hit him up on Twitter and I was like, Hey man, can I get this printed and like hang it up in my house? And he was like, yeah, you can. And I was like, tight. If I didn't own this, it would feel really cheap if I did that. Mm -hmm. And like, not cool of me to just like, make a print of something but because i own it i can do that right. yeah wow i still had to ask permission though i'm a, you know you well, know that's right. i'm a jar right? if, you, I thought if you bought it you could print it yeah right? and some people will do like if you buy it we will print it you know we'll get it printed if you buy it for x amount of money mm, i think wow. i think ultimately the real thing is like the the way for people to understand it more or the way for people to not be so like spiteful of it is yeah. because you see all these people making gajillions of dollars doing it but when it becomes more practical like I've done some nft art releases of my own and like you can buy one for like 10 bucks you know and I think that that doing something that's more financially accessible to people yeah. it's way different than being like hey yeah my friend made this nft project you'd love it oh cool how much does it cost to get into it eight thousand dollars right you got that laying around don't you like <laughs> it doesn't feel it feels like the rich getting richer kind of yeah. thing which is a turnoff you yeah know? it really is even for people in it i'm like are you just flexing like why are mm-hmm. you trying to flex that you have a picture worth a hundred thousand dollars like yeah good for you dude yeah also, oh, yeah. like, going back to the screenshot thing and the people are like, that whatever. So let's take the Mona Lisa. There's only one original Mona Lisa, but there's right. thousands of print of right. that one image. Nobody gives a shit about the prints and, like, right. wherever it's on T-shirts and shit or mugs or uh, fake prints. People care highly about the original painting. Right. Like, it's priceless. Yeah. Can't, couldn't, there's no money in the world that could pay for it. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I mean, totally to your point, I don't, I think that the right click save thing is more of these people just like hating on it. You Mm -hmm. know, they're like, well, I don't, and I think it also comes back to this, it's this weird, like the fat of it has now spoken for more of it, like more of the culture behind it and the culture surrounding it than the actual good sides of it. Like I know artists that didn't have any income that are now making, like they put out one piece of art and make $10,000 $10,000 on it because someone with the money was like, cool, I really like your art. Mm-hmm. I'm going to own it. Yeah. You know? And then I, I don't know. It, it It's this weird kind of, we don't, like I said earlier, nobody knows what the fuck is going on with any of it. Right. But I think that it's here to stay. It's just like, how is it going to Develop. work? How is it going to work for everyone? Right. You know? Yeah. Like, Cause right now it is a specific niche of people. Yeah. Cause like half the people don't understand half the people can't afford it. Like, yeah. Half the people like doubt it or un- are aren't uninterested. It's really it's been so much targeted towards just like uh, the crypto people and the artistic people, and yeah. so all the other ones were like, "Huh? <laughs> like, yeah. how do we do this?" And then there's like the other thing where it's like, "Hey, you went and saw into the new Doctor Strange movie. Well, did you know if you put your ticket number into this website, you'll get an exclusive." Doctor Strange NFT. Mm. That didn't happen, but like oh, yeah. there are like, things damn. like that where it's like you went to this music festival and bought a Coca Cola. You have a Coca Cola NFT music festival thing. Yeah, now. oh, so like, they'll just give it to you. Now. I had yeah. a, I got a Coachella NFT, and I, what does that do? Right, I don't. Like, I, don't I don't know. know. I just got one though. Well, no, but log in and get it. Well, I did, okay. but it's like <laughs> I, I don't know what value it holds. I just kind of downloaded it, and I was like, oh, this is, is kind of cool. Cute? It was like an Easter egg, and it bloomed. Like over the weekend, it bloomed into a flower because it was Easter weekend. Oh, cute! Oh, okay, yeah. But see, I, I mean, <laughs> that's the start of something, though. Yeah, like, I mean, everybody's trying to hop on and evolve yeah. and adapt. Like you see all of these companies being like starting. Yeah, because they have to. Well, for me, you know, there are these things that it costs nothing to make. Like I don't. The whole thing with NFTs is like you have to spend money to create it and like put it on the ethereum blockchain like it costs like a hundred bucks to mint the Mm -hmm. piece but there are these other things 
Uh, they're called PO apps, which is just, it's like free to make, free to claim, doesn't have any value, but it's like I was there. It, it's like your Coachella thing. Because mm. you were there, now you have a thing. It's more of a memorabilia oh, okay. thing. Right? So, again, it's like it's this application. The exclusivity of it. Right. And it's just the, the memory of it, the exclusivity of it. It's like the, well, I was there, and that's why I have this thing. So, for me, I'm like, how do I incorporate this without doing something that's like, Muzzy bear NFTs. It's just different bears with different <laughs> patterns and hats and kooky <laughs> eyelids and like I don't like I Your don't want to. Radio do voice th- is great. <laughs> Years of practice. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like for me, it's like how do I do something where? And the thing that I've been working on is like, okay, you come to one of my shows, you get one of these free "I was there" NFT things you put it on an app on your phone and then because you have that you can use it to like get a channel in my discord that's just those people that were at that show or at a show and now you get early access like pre-sale tickets to other muzzy bear shows i love that that's great stuff like that it's like how do i create value for the people who support me it's not so much like well you bought this thing and maybe one day it'll be worth more than when you got it for it's Mm -hmm. like that's great but it's really, again, going back to, like, the real... It's like a key into something else. Right. And, you know, okay, another thing that I'm trying to do or starting work on is, like, releasing a beat tape and having each beat be a different NFT. So if you buy one, you get the full song. And then once all of them are sold, I'll send, like, the 10 people that have it the full beat tape. Mm. Wow. You know, stuff like that yeah. where you... Like, it affords people to be creative, not just with the art, but with the technology. I think that there's a lot of, like, real use cases. Okay, one of my favorite producers and DJs is Disclosure. Mm. Everybody know you know, the face logo yeah, they've yeah. had forever. They sold that as an NFT, and the person that owns it can go to any Disclosure show for free and bring three friends. Oh, So my stuff God. like that, you know, wow. where it's like... Wow, that's great. Yeah, well, that's where I start to see, like, the value and exclusivity and all that. Otherwise, like, it's just the image online. I'm like, I don't. Yeah. I need more reason for this. Yeah. That's super cool. I think it's more about what it represents. And, like, from an artist's perspective, again, it's like, this is, like, oh, you're, you support me enough to spend a couple hundred bucks or whatever or 50 bucks to this thing, to buy this thing. Now I know that you exist and you are a big supporter of me because you were willing to spend money. I'm going to do things for you now. Wow. I'm going to connect with you. Oh, you make music too. Send me your music and I'll write notes for you and I'll help you make music or whatever. Have you made like, a connection like that with somebody? I have on the, I was a fan of them and hit them up. Like I bought some artwork that I liked and now we're friends on Twitter because they saw that I liked it. Wow, okay. And we're talking about collabing, you know, oh, like great. making okay. art together. It's just like that kind of connectivity, again, I think is kind of where, especially like artists, our whole thing is we're using art to connect with other people. We're like, this is how I see the world. Someone sees your art, they're like, hey, I, I also feel that way. Mm. And your art portrays how I feel about the world. I like you. Like, mm-hmm. that's all art is. It's just yeah. people not understanding how to say in words yeah. how they feel or how they see the thing. So they make an art about it. Right. They make one single art about it or whatever, and people connect with it. So I think that there's this new kind of like, oh, you bought this thing? I know, I know now that we connect in the world the same way. So, of course, I want to be more connected with people that share a worldview like with me or share an appreciation for my music and you know my influences and all that stuff so what is um music and this creative space done for your mental health drive me nuts okay (laughs) it's like good and bad driven me nuts yeah i mean (laughs) the thing that's the thing that's hard and i see a lot of people going through it when it's more of this like the whole thing now is like okay i have this new avenue where i can put out this work that isn't on spotify it's just for the people that own it. Here it here it is. It's like, how do I compete in a world where like these massive companies are making the or, like these big MFers and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff? Like they have become companies because they have thousands of people that support them. Mm-hmm. How do I like break through that? Yeah. So that part's hard. 
But at the same time, I'm of the mind that there are always people out there looking for the thing that you have mm-hmm. if you put it out there. Mm. And, you know, you need to, I mean, you get that. You're like, I'm me. Look, here I am. You guys are both like that. Like, look at us. We're on social media mm-hmm. doing the thing. And like, Just sharing, look, yeah. this is who I am. Do you yeah. vibe with me? And there are people that vibe with you guys. Like, that's just, I think, what this whole past 10 years of our lives have mm-hmm. been about understanding is like, how do I find more people like me? And the internet's shown us there are people out there, yeah. you know, for better or for worse. Yeah. But, you know, I think that you can either be like hard on yourself about that when you're trying to put yourself out there and it's like not working. Like when I put out a song and it has 50,000 listens, I'm like, hell yeah, dude. Mm -hmm. And then I see another person put out a song the same week that has 10 times more views as me. And I'm like, damn, (laughs) I suck. (laughs) But like (laughs) you can either have the damn I suck or the hell yeah, I got people that vibe with me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All about perspective. Yeah. I think it, it really is about perspective and kind of, not letting the negativity get to you, Mm -hmm. but also allowing yourself to feel that and process through it and be like, okay, I can hold on to this for like five minutes and feel, feel some kind of Mm -hmm. way. And then I got to let it go because I'm never going to finish more music. If I'm always worried that someone else is going to have more plays, Mm -hmm. right? you know, cause then I need to be Justin Bieber or something for me to ever be happy. Are you in therapy at all? I have been, have been, um, I'm like I off have it been now. before. <laughs> I have been many times. <laughs> um, but like I just moved to Denver, so I'm mm. still I'm kind of like getting my bearings and figuring out like which doctor I go to right. and then mm. also which therapist I go to. And like I have friends that are therapists and they're like, don't use one of those apps. And I'm like, I, but I don't know where the real yeah, one is. I, yeah, go yeah. in like, I don't know. <laughs> I thought that was my only option. You know what I'm saying? Right. So mm-hmm. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm a big advocate for therapy. Mm-hmm. I have certainly had moments in my life where I would not be here had it not been for therapy and like medication and all of that stuff. Like there are, it, there are people that it's their life's work to make people work through the process of living. Mm, and that's true, yeah. Yeah. I mean, was, I mean, was your goal to always move here? It was definitely, I mean, kind of just happened. Okay. I, like, Yes. Yes and no. Like, I don't, it was one of those things where I always thought I'd be a Michigan boy for the rest of, like, Mm -hmm. forever. Like, I'm good old Midwestern, nice (laughs) Jewish boy. I never change in. And then (laughs) I started spending more time out in Colorado and spending time in Denver and visiting friends and doing all that stuff. And I was like, okay, Colorado, it's just Michigan with mountains instead of lakes. And I'm like, okay, (laughs) it's nice. And the weather's beautiful. And like, oh, wait, there's, cool people my age doing things I like yeah. doing here. Okay. Yeah. What's a creative space in comparison? Like, how do you, how do you feel out here? I mean, besides amazing, <laughs> I think, you know, for whatever reason, the whole, the scene that I came up in with Grizz and Big G and Pretty mm-hmm. Lights and all that stuff kind of started here. So it mm-hmm. really grew here and became a thing here so a lot of musicians yeah like I know you guys had Maddie O'Neill on like we've been friends forever she's always been living here so like in the back of my mind I was always like oh Denver is home away from home and now Mm. Denver is home yeah you know it was just kind of like natural progression hap just kind of happened how long have you been here six months okay wow yeah yeah but I mean I'm assuming you've visited here a lot so it doesn't feel too new does it I've probably spent like two years worth of time here. Wow. Over the past like seven or eight years. It's like a little yeah. way to dip your toes in. Yeah. You know, it was a little three weeks here. <laughs> yeah. Two <laughs> weeks there. <laughs> yeah. When did the glitch analog life of you s- come about? Okay. A few years ago, uh, we talked about this like right before the episode started, but like used to be super into psychedelics and mm-hmm. smoking weed and all that stuff. Like it was like a wake up smoke have coffee, roll another joint while I'm drinking my coffee, smoke that, like, go to music, whatever. Um, And then when, like, out of nowhere, I just started having massive, earth-shattering panic attacks and, like, dissociative episodes whenever I tried to smoke weed. When was that? This is now 
six years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, like, I tried for a while. I was like, I'll just dip my toes in. I'll just <laughs> take one puff. And then one puff turned into two puffs, and I was like, I'm still good. And then two puffs turned into three puffs, and I was like, I'm seeing the devil. I'm good. Wow. Yeah, and, like, just kind of, like, way too much for me. But I still, like, enjoyed psychedelic art and psychedelic mm-hmm. thought and all of that stuff. And, you know, there was a part of me, like, I knew that glitch art existed. I was always a fan of it and very curious about it. Um, I hired this guy to make some show visuals for me because we were doing these, like, live stream shows over the pandemic. And I was like, yo, I need something visual that feels like mine. So I hired this guy to make a bunch of video content for me. And we ended up becoming good friends through that. And I was like, yo, man, like, I'd love to hire you again, but what I would really love is for you to kind of point me in the right direction as far as making this stuff for myself because I really love how it looks, and it kind of, like, it's like visual drugs to me. You're you like know? a, you give me this 90s boy vibes. Totally. Yeah. Like, <laughs> thank you. I'm, I appreciate that. Like the loud T-shirts and, like, yeah. this, like the your feed also gives me that vibe, too. Yeah. Score. <laughs> it's working. <laughs> Okay, wow. Um, so, yeah, I, I, you know, it just was like all this It kind of just like came to a head. I was really bored over the pandemic. You know, I was trying mm-hmm. to find new outlets and avenues. And this guy, his name is Luis. Uh, Luis. Yeah. He, he goes by Zombtendo. Z-O-M-B-Tendo. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. Check out wow. his Instagram. He's like unreal. Wow. Um, but he's been like a really become a good friend and like really great kind of source of Hey, why is this not working? Oh, you got it. You should try doing this. Like, I love all that. helpful people. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it was one of those moments where, like, I try and be that person for other people, and I, I finally was on, like, the asking end. I was like, please, help me. The karma me. came back around. Yeah, he help. was like, yeah. check this out, check this out, try that, try this. You have VHSs, right? I'm like, somewhere. <laughs> and I had, like, at one point over the pandemic, like, I just had my little old TV my VA, my VCR huh. and an Alice in Wonderland VHS. And wow. I was like, I was like, this is perfect. Oh. I have everything I need. Alice came through. Alice came that. through. <laughs> you mentioned that, um, you're going to turn 30 September 30th. Everybody <laughs> say happy birthday. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So, you know, Stephanie turned 30 a year and a half ago or something, but have you ever heard of Saturn return? Your, your Saturn ret- return. What is this? <laughs> so, I don't want to like botch this, but when you turn thirty, like it's like oh wait, it's your golden, like something comes back, like yeah. it takes thirty years to come back. So like your Saturn's returning. So like mm. it's common for your thirtieth year or coming into your thirtieth year that a huge shift will start to happen in your life. Like I know Stephanie, your entire life got <laughs> turned <laughs> upside yeah, <that's> down. <laughs> Not upside down in a bad way. Well, yeah, right, but it like story. it's like everything oh, no, no. changes, or not <laughs> ne- not necessarily everything changes, but like it's it common for people to kind flipped. of your whole algorithm is like, all right, time for a little remix. <laughs> do you feel that kind of happening? Also, it's special to turn thirty on a thirtieth, right? You um, better do something big. It's golden birthday. It's the beginning of a new decade. I don't know. Or, Decade? Ten years, yes. yes. I, I don't know why in my head I'm like, a decade and a dozen are the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It fucks me up. I'm like, no, a dozen's 12, a decade's 10. <laughs> Get it through your head. Um, do you feel this, like, shedding kind of coming? I, you know. Some it, comfortability? I feel like for the first time in a while, I am, like, laser focused. Like, I can see what I want to be doing in like a year or in two Mm. years or over the next few years and like how to get there. I'm like, okay, I have a really cool, my friend is my manager and she's really just like in my corner and we're working on plans. It's just like, she understands the whole ADHD thing. And she's like, okay, send me the tracks that you have Mm. the demos. And we're going to tell, I'm going to tell you which ones we should put out in order. And then you spend the time finishing them in the order that I think we should put out. And I'm like, yes, that. So, wow. like, I think, like, your 20s is kind of figuring out how shit works. And then your 30s is, like, making the shit work. Yeah, wow. You know? That's very amazing. I <laughs> wanted to ask about your ADHD and how mm. um, this has maybe influenced all of your art projects and art endeavors and, and music that you do. But how does it 
you know, good or bad? Like, how does it affect the influences and maybe it inspires you in some kind of way or, and, but how does it affect you in, in so far as getting like things done? It's a nightmare. <laughs> well, are you I can't me- on get medication shit done. at all? I'm scared of the medication. I'm mm. prescribed, but like I, I'm prescribed like a 10 milligram dose of Adderall. And when I take it, I'm just like, <laughs> like I feel like I'm like sitting, but floating You're an ascending. inch off the ground, you know, like it's, it's a little too intense for me. Um, so I try not to take it and just like make life kind of conducive yeah, yeah. to my ADHD because it's really different for everyone. Mm-hmm. Like no one, no two people with ADHD are alike. So I think it's weird that they have this like one size fits all. You take Adderall or you take Vyvanse or you take Ritalin or whatever. Um, but like, yeah, for a long time, I mean, most of my twenties, I was like kind of negotiating with my ADHD, like what kind of music do I want to make? Okay, I'm going to try and make this music. And then I make some of that, and I'm like, okay, no. And I'll make something else. I'll be like, uh, mm. okay, this is cool now, and that other stuff is garbage. And like, cool, this is this is the thing now. And then I make a bunch of that kind of music. And then the same thing happens. I'm like, oh, I'm going to do this kind of music now, and the other kinds of garbage. And like, I never felt mm. comfortable stylistically. The the That was the downside, right? It was like never being focused long enough to see something through. Uh, I'm a big, like, do it and then leave. Yeah. Like, hyper fixating person where I'm like, I'm all about making hip-hop beats. I'm going to be the best hip-hop beat producer of all time. So I got really good at making hip-hop beats. Never released any of them. Mm-hmm. They're just sitting on my hard drive now. But the good thing is, is now I got really good at making hip-hop beats, which yeah. is, like, a whole thing. It's like, wow. now I have this skill, and, like, I love making beats, and it made me a better producer in general mm. and kind of diversified my skill set. But it also, like, kept me from finding my sound of this house, groovy, mm. disco, whatever, muzzy bear sound. Disco Dan. Disco Dan, exactly. <laughs> Cute. Um, I love Wow, that. my best friend has ADHD, and I, I've never been diagnosed. I don't really think, I mean, I have to have a calendar where I check things off. Like, I don't think I should, I feel like I would know. Maybe I. That's just normal. I don't, I don't fucking know. But, yeah. like. He has ADHD. He doesn't take medicine except sometimes when he wants to get shit done. Mm. Also produces music. Has literally like hundreds, like so many songs that yeah. he's never released one thing. And he's been trying to work on his ADHD. And he says one, and I know everyone's different, but he's been trying to set like really small goals for himself. Yeah. And he was like, that really helps me. He yeah. was like, for my brain, he was like, if I can get to why i can get to z and yeah. like he was like it just step by step like because in his head he's like oh i want to i want to be here someday and i want to do this but like in being overwhelmed he never gets to it and he's just like it's too big of a goal so he's yeah. had to like shrink it to these like little baby steps <laughs> yeah i think the one kind of common thing the more that i understand myself and my adhd and talk to other people that have it and like go on TikTok and see all of the ADHD talk stuff that's on my <laughs> timeline is like, that is very true. Is this kind of like, I think everyone's a big picture person and very like, you know, at least our generation's very like hopes and dreams and like anything's possible and we mm-hmm. can do anything that we put our minds to. And yeah. Like, that's great and very true. But ADHD people, ADHD people like miss some of the, the step by step there where it kind of clicks for other people. Yeah. So Definitely kind of having the short term satisfaction of like, ooh, little dopamine burst because mm-hmm. I finished this one song this week. Like yeah. I did it. This one yeah. thing. I made progress in this one area and now I'm one step closer to the thing being what it is. Like that is the the one of the biggest I guess tricks that I learned. Wow, that's it's cool. Like, it's cool to know. Let I, me convince myself that everything is as important as everything yeah you know? i um i have severe adhd like i've had it i was diagnosed like 76 milligrams of concerta when i was Ooh. or 72 when i was at a young age yeah definitely over prescribed um and then when i turned 21 i stopped taking it for several several years um also didn't i stopped taking it because i was sitting in the car one day and my heart rate was just like and the, my friend that was with me as a nurse, and he took my pulse, and he was like, you have the heart rate of, like, a 500-pound man. Mm-hmm. And he was like, this is – he's." and then I started researching, and he was like, this can alter your DNA. Like, if you're taking it 
every single day for the rest of your life, which that doctor told me, he's like, you're going to have to take this every day. And so I stopped taking it, cut cold turkey, which I didn't even know you weren't supposed to do that because you can develop things like schizophrenia and like all these issues. Um, Luckily that didn't happen, but um, just getting as busy as I have been and noticing how hard it is for me to just like, I'm always kind of just working and staying on task, but it's hard for me to like do as much or like even small things like conversations, my memory, just if I'm talking to someone, luckily I can pretty much focus always in this podcast, but in day-to-day conversations, like if someone's talking to me, it's just like out because I'm like thinking of so many other things. Mm. I don't listen to music while I'm editing because it's, um, it's a place where I can just have silence and I'm just like in my head constantly when Mm. there's like, it's always just so loud, you know? Yeah. Um, but I was recently re-prescribed Concerta again, um, which is a time release, and uh-huh. it's uh, 36 milligrams, but um, I only take it three times a week. Yeah. And sometimes I just won't even really, unless I absolutely need it, take it at all. But I found that because of that, I'm breaking apart, like, where there's days where there's three days I'm not using it. There's no addictive personality to it. There's right. no, like, any of that. And that's really worked for me. So if you have ADHD out there, maybe try that. Just don't be t- taking it every day is very scary. Yeah. Um, I was absolutely addicted to it at a young age, not in a bad way. Like I could stop really fast, but it just like was oh, so just scary. Like yeah. It was scary. Um, but that's it. <laughs> I mean, that <laughs> was, that was the same thing for me too. Like I remember I guess my parents didn't tell me this until I started taking medication, but like I got diagnosed as ADHD when I was in like fourth grade. Mm. Yeah, same. I'm almost fifth, I think. How yeah. do you tell? Just can't. You just Is can't focus the in grades, I'm sure, right? Yeah, it was it was just one of those things. Like I think that there was like when like the kind of the turn of the millennium happened, ADHD was this kind of like new diagnosis for kids that were hyperactive and like some people genuinely had it but some a lot of cases got Mm -hmm. misdiagnosed uh but then like when school started to get more rigorous you know late middle school early high school my parents were like hey listen you have adhd and that's why you fall asleep in class sometimes because it's boring and that's why you have you lose your energy sometimes and that's why you get really wound up late at night you know whatever oh they're like that's why this that and the other thing and you know i went to a like I guess it was a, th- they told me it was for one thing, but it was really for ADHD. It was a therapist mm-hmm. situation where they're like teaching emotional skills and teaching study skills and habits and all this stuff. Uh, and that kind of happened around eighth, ninth grade. And by the time I went to college, I was like medicated every day, taking Adderall, going to school, coming home, taking a little bit more Adderall to do my homework after school. And like, I got to college and all of a sudden I was on my own and I didn't have this like person. I didn't have my parents kind of like making sure that I was on track of things and I was left to my own devices. And I was like, Oh wait, I can cram for a test if I take an Adderall and stay up all night because it will keep me awake. And like, I was never like overdoing it, but I was definitely so used to doing it. That I was like, oh, okay, I can take it and I'll be fine like if I, you know, the, like I'm bending the rules. I'm making yeah. it work for me. And like that, that was when I got scared of it. And I was like, yo, I am running myself ragged. Like, mm, yeah. you know. I feel like a lot of people do that. They rely on it in that way. Yeah. And okay. it's, it's like, I could, I couldn't do school without it. Right. And then I realized that maybe it was just wrong place, wrong time situations where like now looking back on it, I'm, I'm like coming from a more mature place and like now when I take it I'm like okay cool this works because it turns my mind off I don't get this like crazy hyperactive stay focused like energy boost that I used to feel like like I got it and like I feel like I was mismet like wrongly medicated when I was younger and now I'm like kind of in a place yeah a lot of people like we're just we were the guinea pigs yeah we were the guinea pigs for this this whole ADHD generation and now I feel like we've kind of learned People have learned to live with it and people have learned to live with it and using medication and people have learned to live it without medicating and, you know, yeah, it's just weird, weird. In general, the whole thing's weird. It makes me feel weird. Mm. Having it, I am weird because I have it. I'm already weird and having it makes me more weird kind of thing and I'm just like, all right, whatever. This is who I am. Well, with, the, with the guinea pig thing, I heard that, like, millennials have it the hardest. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Well, yeah, my uh, boyfriend put it this way. He was like, you know our parents 
bought houses for 20000 and now we're having to buy them for 200000 and we've been through, like, a pandemic At and, least. like, all these things. Mm. And he was like, and then the next year you have, like, these TikTokers coming and being like, I just made a post and, like, buying the houses for, like, 300000 and stuff like that. And he's just like, yeah, we have it caught a break and i was like damn we really are right in the middle of fucked which i also yeah. like heard that you know people living longer like people aren't dying so there's not as many houses going on the that's market that's what you're saying too. and <laughs> like we're like our generation is just like can't afford housing we're stuck in apartments and you know we probably won't get houses a lot of us it, there's a statistic that 30 percent of millennials will own houses only 30 percent and, um, you know, a lot of us won't own houses until our parents and family die. Wow. But yeah, like our retirement homes are going to be lit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when we're all up in the nursing homes together, it's going to be a party. <laughs> um, I do want to kind of like spin it around a little bit. Um, I know that you've mentioned like you're close with your family and you also have mentioned that you're Jewish, which I didn't know that. And. How has your family been with you being, like, open about being gay and everything? How's that? Well, um, some of them still are, like, in the... Okay, this is weird, right? I feel it's just one of these things. Um, so I came out to my parents, like, pretty soon. Like, we're super close. And it was wow, kind of good. more of, like, a... Uh, like, yeah, like, six, six to eight months into me like being like yeah this is who i am for oh sure. i thought you meant like six eight months old i was like yeah wow. i was a baby <laughs> my first words were i'm queer <laughs> um yeah it was one of those things where like i think i think i always knew and i was kind of repressing it because i got bullied a lot and it was mm -hmm. like always very fixated on like sexual orientation like it felt like uh oh, it's just dudes being dudes but except for dan like specifically we're gonna make fun of him for it so i felt very extra repressed mm -hmm. growing up and then I started becoming more comfortable with who I was and what age was that when you like, found that comfortability when I moved away from home to like do college and like mm -hmm. start going to parties and you know hanging out with people that were more my people and not so much like the community that I grew up in of like I don't know just like uh. yeah everyone was the same where I grew up it was very mm -hmm. like you know Stepford wives ish just yeah. like Everyone, every kid that I went to high schools with parents were like, I went to Jewish high school. So everyone's parents were like a doctor or a lawyer or mm. a rabbi Is or like being queer as accepted in that space. Yeah, I, you know, it is. The thing with that culture is that there's varying degrees of like how how serious you are about it. Yeah, I grew up very not like, OK, my family is what we call high holiday Jews. So like we mm -hmm. go to synagogue for the big ones. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the new year, the Yom Kippur, like the day of atonement. Like we were that, but like culturally very, very Jewish, like proud of our heritage and all that stuff. Um, but you know, so for me, it wasn't so much about that. I think it was just like the culture is also very like, this is who we are and we are this way for this reason. But I never felt like, it wasn't allowed. I just felt like that wasn't who I was. I wasn't queer growing up. Like I didn't feel that way because I was, I felt like it was not right. I don't know. It so what you ever, in, like even, did you ever even try to be interested in women based off of like just being bullied? Like, did you try? I mean, I'm, I'm somewhere in the queer verse. Like, mm. I don't know where I'm at. You know, I, I'm just like, I'm me. That's oh, yeah. it. You yeah. Know, okay. Like, I, if you're if you're pretty, you're pretty. If you're nice, you're nice. Okay. You know, like, like energy based. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't and that's kind of how I always was, but like definitely was chasing after girls like in that age where it was like, Yeah, that's what we're all doing. Yeah. Okay. But I was never like the same like I feel like some of these other some other guys are like were always way more focused on it than I was. Mm -hmm. And I was more just like perpetually totally fine with being in the friend zone i was like yeah i'm friends with girls that's it like cool yeah one of one of my friends is pretty great like oh do i have such a crush on her <laughs> like you know like that was me in high school like I, I wasn't like what made you what what was the moment where you're like oh i i'm i like guys like I, what was that I think it was starting to spend more time in places where that was normal. Wow, yeah. And spending more time in queer spaces around friends that were queer and just like... Wow, that's so important. Feel like. and, the, and the more important thing was just I started to feel like myself. Like I didn't mm. feel like 
anything. I didn't feel gay or straight or anything. I just felt like Dan, finally. I was like, it's like, this is good. And I was around people that supported me for who I was in places where that's the energy of it. And, you know, it's still, you know, I came out when I was 24. Okay. So I was a late bloomer. Right. Um, but, you know, everyone's been supportive since. It was always just kind of... When you were ready. When I was ready. And, you know, there are still people who I think only know because I've posted on social media and they haven't like, like fam- like extended family. We haven't talked about it yet, but everyone knows. It's just kind of mm. one of those things where like, oh yeah, Dan's moved to Denver and is living with his boyfriend, his friend who's a boy. They live together. <laughs> <laughs> like, wait, are they, are they? And they're like, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah. They are. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, not well, surprised. H- well, how long have you and your boyfriend been together? We have We've been we've been going strong, Aww. serious. Um, we got together. I, w- I would say, if you were to ask both of us, <laughs> and it was one of those things where like we were both trying to be right. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say three years. Oh, okay. Four years, but like the whole the whole saga has been like five or six years, okay. on and off, yeah, kind yeah. of like it's great. This is a nightmare. It's amazing. <laughs> this is really scary. You know, like, <laughs> one Aww. of those things. Okay. Um, but, like, yeah, uh, I'd say, like, four years. Okay. Is, like, it's been going strong, going going steady, going strong. Well, I feel like it's hard. I don't really know a ton of queer people in the electronic music scene. Maybe there are mm. a lot more than I know, but... Less than there should be. Yeah, less than there should be, and... um. So how has that been in that space? Like, do you feel this push to be loud about it or no? I, hmm, I don't ever want to tokenize myself. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if being loud is the same as, like, I try and differentiate. Like, I'm loud in general. I'm Mm -hmm. a loud motherfucker. Like, that's just just who I am. But I try and be very proud about who I am. So I don't shy away from that. But I'm not, like... I'm queer. Right. And also, like, there are people that are, like, way more, I don't know, I'm not trying to quantify queerness here, but, like, I feel like there are more, like, I'm not the person that's trying to carry the flag for queerness in dance music. Right. I'm happy to, like, be a part of the- not hiding it. I'm not hiding it. I'm proud of it. I want to see more of it, and I'm certainly, like, very anti, like, the straight bro DJ world that I think is kind of- monopolized dance music up to this point it's like we need more queer people dance music started with queer black people and we need more women and we need more just like representation in general Mm. in electronic music so that's where i'm at i'm like i fit under this banner of like need to see more people like me in this space but i'm not saying that in the sense that like i am the example by which you should bring other people into this space i'm still like a white dude i just happen to be queer like you know it's like it's, but it's good to, I mean, it's just good to not be quiet at all, yeah. you know? So I love that. that yeah, I'm going to call it out when I see it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's, that's how I am. I just, you know, my, my attitude is very just like pro everyone should have the same chances. Mm. And I think that up until the past few years, there was a lot of like, whitewashing in electronic music like there are not a lot of black djs when this is the culture that was birthed from like black voices and in black spaces and you know the same goes for queer spaces and you know queer like i think i'm gonna get my history wrong here but it's like the beginning of all of dance music started with gay black men Mm. like and women and trans women men just like looking for a place to go. It's the same with disco music. It was like, this is almost an act of resistance, us making this music that sounds happy, but if you listen to the lyrics, it's kind of like really deep and, mm. you know, about about getting through. That. And, you know, I, again, like, I'm not the person to represent this thing. I just really resonate with it, so that's what I'm doing. But, like, I think that standing up for people and, like, using my privilege to help other people get, the representation that they deserve is like that's what I'm that's what I'm on right now. Oh, I love it. You know. Do you have like a chosen family? My I mean, I think your friends are your chosen family. Yeah. So, you know. Um, I think yeah, I, man. Well, I mean, how often do you get to see your fa- your actual family? Uh well, 
if you look at my FaceTime uh-huh. history, there's a lot of missed calls from different family members uh-huh. because I'm I'm guilty. I'm like not a phone guy. Like my ADHD, I'm like, oh, a text message, great. <laughs> you know, Just get to that later. But like we FaceTime every a, a few every like a few days a week, or you know, I talk to my I have a sister. She's like my best friend in the world. Um, and we talk pretty consistently, even if it's just like sending each other TikToks, like, hey, I yeah, saw this yeah. and thought of you. I'm like, that's a communication method now, I guess. Yeah. But, you know, I uh, I just went home to like, it was I had a friend's wedding that I went to and it was Passover. So I was home for two weeks and saw my family and I'm going back next week because it's movement in Detroit. So I'll see them then. And it's one of those things, I think, especially with Jewish culture, too, it's like, they're always reeling us back in for the next <laughs> family visit, you know. <laughs> That's cute. Um, and I'm all for it. Yeah, I mean, like, my dad and my mom and my sister, like, we are core unit, you know. We love that. Yeah. Well, when are you, um, what is something that you're working on now? Or, like, when are you planning on releasing new music? Well, Ooh. funny you should mention that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I've got a few shows coming up. Ooh. Um, I'm actually playing in town on Friday, if you guys. When? Friday night. Wait, this Friday? This Friday. I'll be here. Let's go. Uh, I'll be by myself. <laughs> Damn it. Will well, you take friends. me under your wing? Uh, yeah, get in, get in here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll be in New um, Mexico. So I've got some shows coming up. I'm playing here, and then I have a show. I'm actually playing in Buffalo, New York. Oh. My manager's from there and, like, is in the show throwing thing. Like, they're having some Pride weekend oh, cool. thing and wanted a DJ. When is that? I think in three weeks. Okay. So, like, I've got some shows coming up, and I'm working on a bunch of music, like I said. I have a single. These are solo shows. Solo shows. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Batty vibes only. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, my music is for the girls, the gays, and the theys. <laughs> oh, I love My that shows are the same. <laughs> <laughs> all of those are welcome. The rest is like, yeah, if you want, fine. Also, have fun. Um, <laughs> buy tickets, though. Uh, <laughs> but, like, I'm yeah, I... Uh, I have some. I have a song that's done. I'm just waiting for like the final vocal and final mix and master thing. So like next month, Ooh. new song, and cool, then cool. every month after that, new more more wow. new songs is the goal. Uh, and then you know, stay posted on my social media, doing NFT art music things. Cool. The audio visual mixtape NFT thing is gonna happen in the next like month. Wow. And a half. Damn, I'm in it now. Yeah. <laughs> wow. We okay. onboarded, guys. <laughs> <laughs> we are you going on tour any, or are you just sticking with the solo shows and everything? Uh, you know, I... Is it up for... Listen, if someone if someone wanted to bring me as a solo act on tour with them, I'd be down. But really, like, what I've realized is, like I said, doing a couple shows a month where I'm home... 20 days of the month and mm-hmm. and on the road 10 max that's Did kind frankie, of my happy place Did frankie come along to all these things you know <laughs> <laughs> i heard it's only a hundred dollars to get your dog registered to fly on planes oh wait boom baby yeah what well pinto's a big one so i don't know about that <laughs> i want to fly boy. pinto's a I'm human i'm trying to fly him to hawaii to see Hawaii Dan. To see Hawaii Dan. Because I'm also there part time, and mm. so I'm just trying to figure out a way to bring him. But last I checked, it was like eighteen hundred dollars. So, but anyways, that's for another time. <laughs> but yeah, I'll, I'll talk. We'll we'll talk about the plug. Yeah, know. let me know the about plug. the plug. Yeah. The dog yeah. plug. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we're excited for everything that you have coming up. We're obviously big fans. Um, yeah. Well, honestly, it's crazy because we were just talking about you, yes. and then you DM'd us, and like we well, were, and like, we were like, uh, it we was were just yeah, we, we were, were either on the phone like, or something like, happened, and we were like, what the fuck? Yeah, like, I was Muzzy like, we messaged to, us. I was like, tomorrow we need to message Muzzy about trying to get him on the podcast, blah blah blah, and then like literally less than twenty four hours, I was like. <gasps> Oh Listen, my what I say, I'm a wild card. Yeah. <laughs> we love it. What I'm I a wild card. <laughs> yeah, it was weird. I yeah, I'm glad it happened the way that it did. I I saw you guys did a few episodes with my friends, and I mm. love coming on and talking shit with cool people. And <laughs> like, we love yeah, it. we have a bunch of mutual friends, and yeah, I was just like. This Let's seems do fun. It. Let's yeah. do Get it. Get your ass on here. Yeah. Here we are. <laughs> it's right here. In this chair. Right now. It's right here. It's, oh, here we going. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> well, um, I guess before we start wrapping it up, we have three questions that we want to ask that have nothing to do with this episode whatsoever. Oh God! And so we're just gonna rapid now fire you're the wild on you. Cars. Oh yeah. good heavens! <laughs> yeah. All right, so Lacey, Drink you can take it. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite way to cook or eat a potato? Oh, baked. Mm, but that? then you got to cut it open and mash the insides. <laughs> right. Would you make it like a loaded baked oh, potato? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A I, slutty baked potato. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what you call them? Is that a thing? That slutty was baked potato? new on your end. A slutty baked potato? <gasps> that one just came out. Okay. Wow. The art we could do for that. <laughs> just like a, a potato with heels. <laughs> Oh my gosh. The ideas are real. <laughs> okay. If you could be good at any Olympic sport, summer or winter, which one would it be? You're oh. gold medalist at this. No oh, ailments. Shit. Summer or winter? Yeah. Dang. Curling. Oh. Mm. I feel like, like it'd be the, really where fun. Where you take it and you're like. <laughs> if it's an individual sport, I think it would be like ski jumping. Like the long jumping yeah, where they like, like fucking oh, fly. That's wow. crazy. I would not. That's because I'm so scared of heights, y'all. Like that, I it, it would be more of like a, I'm overcoming this fear. Like mm. if I is it like is the question that you wake up one day with this God given ability just like <laughs> you? <laughs> it's it's to kind of figure out you're like Sean White now, <laughs> you know, or whatever. If it was like that and I just like rolled out of bed yeah. looking like this and then able to do that and be like not afraid of it. Yes, that would be, be the one. That, like, some kind of, like, jumping off of a, a okay. thing. Okay, yeah. okay, wow. I can't imagine, like, doing, like, being a diver. Those videos mm. trip me out where they dive off of, like, 40 feet high. I don't yeah. know how long that is. I remember I when I was a kid, like, the pool that I used to spend time at in the summers had, like, a five-foot diving board. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, we had one of those too. And um, I was like a kid and there was like a hot lifeguard. And I. <laughs> Why were the lifeguards so hot I always? I knew what they were doing. Yeah. But I like tried to do this strike to impress him and I slipped off of it. And like my entire body like hit the side of the pool. And I have a scar on my ankle from it. And did they oh. have to save you? No, it was another. Oh, that was one way to get some oh. attention. Yeah, yeah. I did, he didn't even notice. Dang. I was like 10. <laughs> oh, my okay. God. But anyway, okay, next question. Would you rather smoke weed on the beach or trip psychedelics in the desert? Both of those sound awful to me. Oh. oh. I'm, seeing d I'm seeing demons. But in my heyday. You, you can make up, uh, you know, an it, answer. This yeah. would be like with no mental. With no anxiety. I gave you A, B. You can give a C. Mm. Mm. No, I think I think I would like to smoke weed on a beach. All right. Because then you're in the open air, you know. Yeah. Even with some anxiety sprinkled in, why not? <laughs> make it, do a little make twist it fun. on it. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, dang. Thank you for coming on. This yeah. has been amazing. Where yeah. can our listeners find you? At uh, at Muzzy Bear with two R's. So M U Z Z Y B E A R R. Okay. Everywhere. All right. Where, where, where did I see the dot ETH? How did I like come in? Up with I that? think it's like in the name. Okay. Yeah. Like okay. Muzzybear.eth is like not my handle, but my like. Your okay. Name. Your yeah. name. My yeah. brain saw that somewhere. There you go. <laughs> you're on top of it. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, you know. Well, well you guys go. need to like turn in on everything he's doing. Listen to his music. Go to his shows. Like they're we're we've been fans for so long. So. Yeah. Just trust us on this one if you're not already familiar. You and know the vibe. Yeah, yeah, and if you've made it so far, thank you. Thank you for listening, and I'm going to let Lacey take it from here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> if y'all want right. to keep up with us, everything is linked down below. It's at Oh Here We Go on Instagram. We are back on TikTok, so... We're trying. We're just two TikToking girls, you know. And Twitter. <laughs> at Oh Here We Go <laughs> podcast, and it's at Stephanie Parsley at the Lacey Claire, but... Just take it easy on yourself and click the links. Yeah, <laughs> or leave, and leave us a freaking review, too. Or something. Come on, now. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. But on that note, we will see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye. <laughs>